Johnny could only sing one note And the note he sang was this When you think about the greatest late-night television series of all time, The Ed Sullivan Show always comes to mind. For many performers, especially singers, it was a stepping stone to superstardom in the music business. It was The Ed Sullivan Show that introduced many amazing singers to the public eye. However, Ed Sullivan had his share of guests' dislikes, even if he was a crucial conduit for talent. When Sullivan presented musicians, he wasn't always amicable due to his demanding personality and irritable temper. Although Ed Sullivan worked with quite a number of artists, there were some he just couldn't stand. And he made it obvious. Early life. The iconic American entertainer Ed Sullivan came into this world in the bustling Harlem neighborhood of New York City on September 28, 1901. Both of his parents, Elizabeth and Peter Arthur Sullivan, encouraged him to pursue his passions, music and sports. Sadly, his twin brother Daniel's life was cut short by illness and only lasted a few months. In addition, he had a sister who passed away when he was barely five years old. Sullivan was also of Irish heritage. The Sullivan family resided in a picturesque red brick mansion at 53 Washington Street in Port Chester, New York, during Sullivan's early years. He spent his first year of high school in New York City. The Sullivans shared a love of music and were a close-knit, Irish-descended tribe. Because they often got together around the piano to play records and sing beautiful melodies, their home was always filled with music. This artistic environment had a lasting impression on young Ed, paving the way for a career in show business. Interesting, right? Get ready to be transported back in time as we dive into the untold stories behind the iconic Ed Sullivan show. Of course, Sullivan's fame and fortune did not begin with the arts and music. He showed off his incredible athletic abilities while he was a student at Port Chester High School, where he became a sports sensation. Sullivan was an all-around standout athlete, earning 12 letters in several sports. He excelled as both a football halfback and a basketball guard. Although he left his rivals in track and field in his dust, his most remarkable achievement was undoubtedly his time spent behind the plate as catcher and captain of the baseball club. Under his direction, the baseball team won a number of championships. After having great success in the arts and athletics, Ed Sullivan decided to try his hand at journalism. His first job out of college was with the Port Chester Daily Item. He dabbled in sports journalism while still in high school, and he was hired by a tiny daily. Soon after finishing college, he started working as a journalist full-time. When he joined the Hartford Post in 1919, he embarked on a thrilling new adventure. But the newspaper went bankrupt in Sullivan's first week on the job, ending what may have been a fruitful career. Despite the setback, Sullivan's journalistic odyssey continued. The New York Evening Mail, where he had previously worked as a sports reporter, also went out of business in 1923. He negotiated news jobs with numerous magazines, including The Leader, The Morning World, The Morning Telegraph, The Philadelphia Bulletin, and The Associated Press. His relentless pursuit of excellence in journalism was rewarded with each new challenge he faced. Taking advantage of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Ed Sullivan joined the New York Evening Graphic in 1927. After being employed as a sports journalist, his skills swiftly elevated him to the position of sports editor. In 1929, meanwhile, his career took a pivotal turn when Walter Winchell, a major player in entertainment journalism, joined the Daily Mirror. Sullivan then took a job writing for the New York Evening Graphic's Broadway section. Consequently, he decided to branch out and join the New York Daily News, the biggest tabloid in the city, in an effort to reach a wider audience. S.A. window into the entertainment industry, Sullivan's daily news piece, Little Old New York, focused on Broadway shows and rumors. In addition to his writing, he also dabbled in radio, hosting shows and news segments. In 1933, Ed Sullivan's many abilities were further showcased in the film Mr. Broadway in which he also acted. 
Through this one-of-a-kind film, he introduced viewers to a plethora of musicians and celebrities while taking them on a vibrant tour of New York City's nightlife. Not only did the film showcase his likability and storytelling skills, but it also marked his transition from written and spoken word to visual medium. The Ed Sullivan Show. How it all began. Marlo Lewis, the famed producer, had a turning point in 1948. With dogged persistence and an inspiring vision, Marlo Lewis embarked on a mission to showcase an extraordinary talent, a name that would come to be associated with legendary status in the entertainment industry, Ed Sullivan, was what he was seeking. With an unshakable faith in Sullivan's star potential and an abundance of charisma, Marlo Lewis embarked on a passionate quest. Even the fearsome CBS network agreed to risk Ed Sullivan once he convinced them. A television phenomenon captivating viewers and shaping the very fabric of American entertainment was formed out of his dogged pursuit of his dream. Toast of the Town, a production that would go on to become famous, had its world premiere in June of 1948 at the Globe. Ed Sullivan made his television debut in the sacred space of New York City's Maxine Elliott's Theater. With an optimistic and dream-filled heart, he invited an entire nation to his universe, laying the groundwork for an incredible journey. However, it is not the conclusion of the story. A brief hush fell over the room, signaling the beginning of a miraculous ascent. Due to its radiant appeal, the play's fame exploded beyond the confines of its original venue. A bigger stage, big enough to hold the whole cast, was required for the charm of the show. In January of 1953, the toast of the town made a successful leap to the next level. A new level of entertainment was brought to the Ed Sullivan Theater by the spirit of a man who had gone beyond the boundaries of entertainment. A platform for artists and entertainers was essential to the show's enchantment. Countless superstars' breathtaking performances like Elvis Presley's swaying hips, the Beatles' groundbreaking debut, and countless more would be on display. Ed Sullivan and The Dreamer who propelled him to stardom were in the house as the audience sang, danced, and smiled along. This shift represented more than just a visual shift. The show's tremendous success and the host's dogged determination were memorialized by it. That moment marked a turning point, when an old radio playhouse was once again the epicenter of American entertainment. Renowned talk show presenters like Stephen Colbert and David Letterman would follow in the footsteps of the man whose name graced the marquee, ensuring that the Ed Sullivan Theater would continue to be a creative hub. The final episode of The Ed Sullivan Show was shown on June 6, 1971, 23 years after the show's initial transmission in 1948. The Elvis Presley, Ed Sullivan Controversy the initial hosts would be Elvis Presley, the unashamed king of rock and roll, and conservative entertainment legend Ed Sullivan. While performing on The Ed Sullivan Show, the unashamed king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley and his entourage were caught in the middle of a cultural confrontation. Their relationships were formed, and the stark differences between the two characters highlighted by this collision of cultural norms and values. While Elvis Presley was performing on The Ed Sullivan Show, a cultural battle erupted between conservative entertainment legend Ed Sullivan and the unapologetic king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Their relationships were defined by the clash of cultures and ideas, which also highlighted the stark differences between the two characters. Ed Sullivan was hell-bent on projecting an image of friendliness and accessibility to his massive audience. His goal was to make his presentation accessible to people of all ages so that he could reach the widest possible audience. Chilling, right? Sullivan was first apprehensive about having the young, divisive performer Elvis on his show because he thought it would go against the family-friendly image he had worked so hard to cultivate. Sullivan gave in and extended an invitation to the budding singer after realizing the immense popularity of Elvis 
and the irresistible charm he had on the younger generation. Elvis, as well as the history of music and popular culture, relied heavily on this decision. The Ed Sullivan Show was a watershed moment in Elvis's career, catapulting him into the national spotlight and establishing the foundation for his legendary status in the music industry. As their lives became more interwoven, Ed Sullivan and Elvis allegedly had heated exchanges during these performances. Performing on The Ed Sullivan Show catapulted Elvis into the national spotlight, where his star began to rise and the foundation for his legendary status in music was laid. Elvis's infectious energy and charisma were too much for Sullivan, who is typically reserved and reserved. Sullivan might have felt nervous and perhaps turned off by the King's natural enthusiasm and vivacity on stage. You could feel the gulf between Sullivan's stuffy, old-fashioned presentation and Elvis's carefree, innovative stage persona. The Ed Sullivan stage's tight production constraints and restricted movement made everyone feel cramped, not only Elvis, who was accustomed to playing in more relaxed and uninterrupted ways. Elvis's electrifying performance was a poor fit for the show's family-friendly concept. Elvis changed the trajectory of his career by creating captivating performances despite constraints and demands. Bo Diddley Bo Diddley was a maverick artist who, aggressively, pushed the frontiers of music, known for his inventive rhythms and breakthrough guitar skills. His sound was a unique and exciting blend of blues, rhythm, and blues and rock. By 1955, he was at the vanguard of a musical movement that was questioning the time's established norms. Ed Sullivan saw Bo Diddley performing Tennessee Ernie Ford's 16 Tons backstage on November 20th, 1955, only a few hours before the show was broadcast on the air. He then asked Diddley to perform the song for the show. As Bo Diddley was automatically hired for an appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, the host had certain expectations. Sullivan wanted Bo Diddley to play a Tennessee Ernie Ford tune as part of the show's usual structure. Bo Diddley, on the other hand, was steadfast in his determination to maintain his musical individuality. He flatly refused to comply with Sullivan's instructions, instead singing his famous hit Bo Diddley. As a result, he valued his artistic integrity while also preserving the core of the nascent rock and roll movement. Bo Diddley's steadfast stance irritated Ed Sullivan, who famously observed that Bo Diddley was the first black boy who ever double-crossed him. This was a moment of great excitement for Sullivan, and it was also a moment of great respect for Ed Sullivan. This disrespectful remark severely outraged Bo Diddley, who stated unequivocally that he would never appear on the show again. The confrontation between Ed Sullivan and Bo Diddley highlighted the conflict between artistic autonomy and the limits of mass entertainment, The Doors. An iconic and well-documented episode in rock and roll's history is the tense relationship that existed between Ed Sullivan and The Doors, especially their mysterious lead singer, Jim Morrison. The conflict between the conservative television host and the rebellious rock band exemplified the generation gap and cultural transformations that marked the 1960s. Under Jim Morrison's flamboyant, erratic, and often confrontational leadership, the Doors emerged as pioneers of psychedelic music. The band's sound and Morrison's charisma on stage were emblematic of the counterculture revolution of the period. The Doors' aggressive music and Morrison's unapologetic onstage attitude were challenging for Ed Sullivan to fully embrace since he advocated for traditional values and family-friendly entertainment. An important request was made by Ed Sullivan in 1967 when the Doors were scheduled to perform on The Ed Sullivan Show. He wanted the lyrics of their hit song, Light My Fire, modified so it would be more acceptable in society. The choice of the word higher in the song particularly irritated Sullivan since, in his opinion, it implied drug use. The band reluctantly granted the request during practice. But Jim Morrison went against the earlier agreement and sung the original lyrics during the live performance. The doors were permanently removed from the program as a result of this bold act of rebellion. 
The incident embarrassed television host Ed Sullivan and infuriated Morrison. There was no longer any possibility of a constructive relationship between The Doors and Sullivan due to the dispute over the song's lyrics. It brought attention to the band's countercultural stance, Morrison's shameless defiance of authority, and Sullivan's desire for dominance and acceptance from the mainstream. The Doors' performance was a turning point in rock history, even after their feuds and subsequent dismissal from Sullivan's show. There was a clear illustration of the widening gap between conservatives and themselves in this. A counterculture emerged in large part because of the Doors' contributions. The Doors' involvement was also crucial to the emergence of counterculture in the 60s. It was clear that this singer was someone that Ed Sullivan despised. Controversy has surrounded this portrait of Ed Sullivan with the notorious Swedish-American singer and actress Anne Margaret ever since black and white television was a thing. She performed her two most famous songs, Baby You Please Come Home and Bye Bye Birdie, on an appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Many assumed that Sullivan and Anne Margaret had a strained relationship because Sullivan wasn't a huge fan of Anne Margaret. Nevertheless, neither of them disclosed any specifics regarding the troubled relationship. Sullivan's reputation for picking fights with his show guests, especially the sensational singers, makes this outcome predictable. Is there a trend to his actions that we failed to notice? Leave a comment telling us what you think. Bob Dylan As the counterculture era began to take hold, Bob Dylan became an icon for the changing folk and rock music landscape with his insightful lyrics and challenging music. His songs voiced social and political concerns and challenged the status quo, making him a symbol of changing cultural trends. They were anti-establishment anthems. During the mid-1960s, Dylan was performing at the height of his fame when he was invited to appear on The Ed Sullivan Show. With Ed Sullivan at the helm, the show provided a major stage for exposure at the time, but the entertainment industry he represented was more conventional and conservative. The rule follower Sullivan struggled to understand and accept Dylan's unconventional style and the controversial themes explored in his lyrics. Although Sullivan's reputation was built on presenting shows that conformed to a more mainstream and popular image, Dylan utilized his art to spark debate, condemn the establishment, and advocate for transformation. Their divergent ideologies and methods laid the groundwork for their eventual confrontation. A tense situation arose during Dylan's preparations to perform John Birch Paranoid Blues, a politically inflammatory song on The Ed Sullivan Show. Lyrically, this song satirized the present political climate, focusing on the Red Scare and the associated communist fears. Too controversial for network television to air. Ed Sullivan, however, didn't seem to mind this scathing critique of the paranoia of the time. When Bob Dylan wanted to sing a different, less controversial song, the show's producer was less lenient and demanded it. The show's producers wanted Dylan to quit, but he was too dedicated to his work, so they let him go. His complete cancellation of the concert was an act of defiance. Ed Sullivan's relationship with the legendary musician came to a close with this decision. Both of their careers were catalyzed by this occurrence. It proved that Bob Dylan will not compromise on the unwavering quality of his work or his dedication to creative integrity. This was a sign of being out of touch with the times and the increasing influence of musicians who sampled other styles to make their own music. Conversely, working with the show's producer was a turning point for them all professionally. Sam Cooke The once promising friendship between Ed Sullivan and the great soul and R&B singer-songwriter Sam Cooke eventually deteriorated into animosity and disappointment. A performance by Sam Cooke, whose voice is renowned for its soulfulness and beauty, was scheduled to air on The Ed Sullivan Show. For the play, he devoted a great deal of time to rehearsals and preparation. Would like to put on a show-stopping performance here on this famous platform. However, Destiny had other plans. 
The production of the program had to wrap up early because of unforeseen events that caused it to run significantly over schedule. Tragically, the talented musician Sam Cooke had his concert cut short, which was both sad and discouraging. This unanticipated setback obviously stung him deeply, and he never got over his humiliation on The Ed Sullivan Show. A deep silence fell between the two men after Sam Cooke chose not to return to the stage after the fight. Contrarily, Ed Sullivan was quick to pass the buck, as if Sam Cooke's complaints were baseless. Although it wasn't enough to mend the relationship, Ed Sullivan released a public apology that showed he understood the seriousness of the incident and wanted to take responsibility. Coincidentally, one of the few known recordings of legendary vocalist Sam Cooke performing live on The Ed Sullivan Show is now considered a rare find. Reminiscent of their bitter rivalry, it also serves to perpetuate Cooke's remarkable charisma and brilliance. Sam Cooke, the movie's indifferent lead, why did he unexpectedly get up on the show? Even though many female viewers have expressed interest in this man's documentary, there are also compelling arguments against featuring him. Ed Sullivan feud with Buddy Holly It was a shaky relationship between Ed Sullivan and Buddy Holly, a brilliant and inventive rock and roll musician from the 50s. His debut on The Ed Sullivan Show catapulted Buddy Holly's talent and influence to a broader audience, but his life and career were tragically cut short. Holy cow! Disagreement arose between the vocalist and the host since this song selection appeared to annoy Sullivan. The fact that the band clearly didn't care about performing on the show just served to further annoy Ed Sullivan. In his innovative fusion of rockabilly, country, and rhythm and blues, Buddy Holly left an indelible impression on music fans. It was a departure from the typical musical acts with whom Sullivan was more familiar with this audio combination. Known for his show's more conventional and scripted manner, Ed Sullivan often had a firm grasp on the way he wanted actors to convey their emotions. In addition, Sullivan wanted to have a firm grip on the acts that were part of his show, while Holly, an up-and-coming artist, wanted more creative freedom and autonomy. Musicians were subject to Sullivan's notoriously stringent standards, which included rules about song choice, dancing, and even clothing. He was also well known for his conventional modes of expression. On Holly's first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, these constraints clashed with her creative vision and candor, leading to an uncomfortable conversation. Since Holly wanted more creative freedom and Sullivan wanted the show to stay inside its strict parameters, tensions were running high behind the scenes as a result of this disagreement. No one can deny the impact that Buddy Holly's appearances on the show had on his career. They played a part in bringing his innovative music to a wider audience, which helped solidify his position in rock and roll history. Because of the unfortunate circumstances surrounding his death in an airplane crash, Buddy Holly's performance on The Ed Sullivan Show is one of the few recorded performances of this famous singer that we possess. Conflicts and tensions notwithstanding, this brief period in the spotlight is an important historical record of a creative genius who had an indelible impact on the music industry. Sadly, a plane crash that occurred on February 3, 1959, at Clear Lake, Iowa, claimed the lives of Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper, all of whom were fellow musicians. Due to the fact that she experienced a miscarriage the day after she found out about the passing of her husband via the television news, she was unable to attend Holly's burial in Lubbock, Ed Sullivan's personal life, Famed TV host and producer Ed Sullivan's personal life was just as intricate and multifaceted as his professional life. Significant parts of his private life included his relationships and his marriage, which had its ups and downs, to Sylvia Weinstein. A life-altering event occurred in 1926 when Sullivan crossed paths with Sylvia Weinstein. A love story was born between them. While Sylvia's family was critical of her connection with Sullivan at first, she quickly decided to block their judgment. She told her relatives she was seeing a Jewish man named Ed Solomon to hide Sullivan's Catholic background. Their family's ideological differences 
made it difficult for them to marry outside of their faith, which hampered their budding romance. There were highs and lows to their romance during the subsequent three years as they navigated the complexities of keeping their love a secret from their disapproving families. During their courtship, societal norms and familial dynamics acted as roadblocks. On April 28, 1930, despite all the odds and contrary expectations, Sullivan and Sylvia tied the knot in a ceremony held at the city hall. No matter how tough their courtship was, their love ultimately won out. A daughter, Elizabeth, who was named Betty, was born to Sylvia eight months later. It was Sullivan's mother, who passed away a year ago, who suggested the name Betty. His mother's memorial was deeply moving. Following Ed Sullivan's departure, the Sullivan family remained active in the television industry. Betty Sullivan wed Ed Sullivan show, producer Bob Precht in 1952. A strong professional connection between the Sullivan family and the entertainment industry was formed through this marriage. Personal and professional lives for the Sullivans were intertwined. In 1944, the family said goodbye to their Times Square home at the Hotel Astor and moved into a suite at the Hotel Del Monaco. In keeping with his professional demeanor, Sullivan rented an apartment adjacent to the family's residence and set up shop there. Within these walls, he oversaw the operations of The Ed Sullivan Show until 1971, when the show ended. His commitment to his art was unwavering, and Sullivan was no exception. His wife Sylvia would be called after each performance to hear his thoughts and opinions. The importance of her opinion to him stemmed from the fact that it revealed the intimate connection between their work and personal lives. As a family, the Sullivans were notoriously gregarious. Their social circle included regulars at Jimmy Kelly's, Danny's Hideaway, and the Stork Club, among others. Sullivan's numerous famous acquaintances and even former presidents were drawn to his warm personality and extensive social network. Aside from that, he was honored to host audiences alongside popes, a testament to his extensive impact in the entertainment business and beyond. Mount Sinai Hospital was the site of Sylvia Sullivan's death on March 16, 1973, adding another devastating blow to the Sullivan family's history. Ed Sullivan will never be forgotten. The Ed Sullivan Show had been a television entertainment superstar for quite some time, but by 1971, its ratings had begun to decline. When CBS realized it needed a new cast in March 1971, they made the difficult decision to cancel the show. It was expected that the show would be broadcast on CBS before year's end. Because it was scheduled to premiere on CBS for the first time ever, it fit in with a larger trend called The Rural Purge, which saw numerous long-running shows canceled in 1970 and 1971. Having presided over the show for decades, Ed Sullivan was not happy about its termination. He was unhappy with CBS's choice and wanted nothing to do with hosting the three extra months of programming. Playbacks of the remaining shows were shown by the network in reaction to his rejection, marking the end of an era. June saw the show's last broadcast without Ed Sullivan, which was a bittersweet moment for fans of the show's storied history. While Ed Sullivan's appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show had diminished in frequency, he continued to play an active role in the network's operations. It was a sign of his significance in the medium that he kept appearing on television. Returning to the screen for a special commemorating the program's 25th anniversary, he did so in June 1973. While attending this occasion, he was able to pay tribute to the show's lasting legacy by reliving some of its most memorable moments. Ed Sullivan's health took a turn for the worse in the years after his last broadcast. The diagnosis that would alter the course of his life came to him in early September 1974. The medical professionals who examined him found that his esophageal cancer had become advanced. His illness was so severe that doctors didn't think he would make it, and being in a coma didn't bode well for his prospects of recovery. Authorities in the medical field informed Ed Sullivan that he had advanced esophageal cancer. 
Unfortunately, Ed Sullivan's family decided to keep the news of his diagnosis from him. A man who has lived his entire life in the limelight would find his diagnosis particularly heartbreaking. For Sullivan, who had a history of gastrointestinal ulcers, his sickness was just another consequence of his smoking habit. Unbeknownst to him, a distinct and considerably more dangerous adversary was his cancer fight. The potential harm that smoking can do to one's health over time was starkly illustrated. The unfortunate Ed Sullivan died on October 13, 1974, at New York's Lenox Hill Hospital, after his health had rapidly declined. With his unmatched legacy, he brought an era to a close in television with his death. A 2,000-person funeral procession was held at New York's Grand Saint, Patrick's Cathedral, as word of his death spread across the nation. A man who had left an everlasting impression on American television was laid to rest on a somber funeral day, with cold, rainy weather fitting the occasion. Mortuary rites for Ed Sullivan took place at Hartsdale, New York's Ferncliff Cemetery. In honor of his enduring influence on American popular culture and the entertainment business, this site stands as a monument. Even outside of television, Sullivan had an impact. The Hollywood Walk of Fame also cast his name in recognition of his achievements. Hollywood Blovd, which he helped found, is named after him. A lasting tribute to his contributions to the field. Your satisfaction with this video is our goal. Next time, we'll see you. Well, we can all say Ed Sullivan lived a fulfilled life to an extent. Have you subscribed yet? Do so now for more thrilling content like this and be sure to turn on post notification to be the first to know when the next video is up.